It's in your wonderful name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Church, you can be seated. Good morning. It's good to be with you today. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's just awesome to see uh, some of our missionaries here and uh, see the Crestmans here. And, you know, the gospel is going out uh, to all the world. Amen. I mean, this is incredible. We've had uh, missionaries here from Africa this morning, from um, uh, the bakers in Papua New Guinea were here, Latvia. Uh, represented here this morning, um, Mexico and Brazil in the Silvas. Um, I know I saw Pastor Roy uh, walking in this morning from our Hispanic church, and the gospel's going out to every tribe, tongue, and nation, and, and God is at work, and we need to celebrate that, you know. Um, I got an a, um, a email this week from somebody saying, you know, if it's too bad Arizona isn't on daylight savings time, um, because on November 5th, when it switches over, you can preach for an extra hour, which, um, <laughs> but we're not on that. So um, turn your Bibles to Numbers chapter 21, Numbers 21. I know we've been going through Exodus, but I want to give you a snapshot of a couple of the events in Moses' life found in Numbers. As you're turning there, uh, we've been continuing to give out memory verses uh, to the church, and we gave you an easy one this week, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. In fact, uh, why don't we say that together? Uh, For we walk by faith and not by sight. Let's say it again. For we walk by faith and not by sight. We need to remember that. We're walking by faith and not by sight. Uh, next week's verse is John 3, 14 to 15, which says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And we're going to touch on that verse um, this morning. But as we've been going through Exodus and, and now a couple of the passages in Numbers, you might wonder, why are we going through these events that happened thousands of years ago? Well, Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 5. He said, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And so we are learning from Israel and what they went through. This has been an example uh, for us even today. And just as, even as I'm saying that, it's a reminder that we need to continue to pray for Israel and what they're going through. You know, it says in Psalm uh, 122.6 to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And um, why don't we do that right now? Let's all bow our heads and pray. Lord, we continue to lift up Israel to you, and we just pray that you would guard and protect them. Even now, we pray for uh, the hostages, many of whom uh, we don't know what has happened to them, and we just pray that you would protect them, Lord. Station your angels around them. Just reassure them, even right now, of your presence. I pray that you'd bind the evil one, that you would root out um, the terrorists or any who choose to do evil, and you would be a comfort to those who are mourning right now. And may many come to know you as Lord and as the true Messiah. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 
So everything that we're reading about Israel, you know, has been written so that we could learn from. There's examples for us to know. Now we're going to fast forward about 38 years from the passage we looked at last week. Last week we were looking at the 12 spies that went into the promised land. That happened around 1445 BC. We're going to fast forward to 1407 BC and this story, this narrative of the bronze serpent. But what I want you to see as we're going through this chapter and why this chapter is so important, because God in this chapter is showing us the way of salvation. He's showing us the the curse of sin. He's showing us the consequences of sin, and he's showing us the cure for sin. And you see it all in these chapters. In fact, the, the curse of sin is laid out, is displayed for us in some of the actions you're going to read about. And I've listed some of them in your notes. Uh, let's start in verse 4 of Numbers 21. From Mount Or they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. So that's the first sin that's mentioned here. Israel went from Egypt to Mount Sinai, they spent about a year there, and then they went to Kadesh Barnea, and the 12 spies were sent out, and the people rejected um, God's call to go into the land, and because of their unbelief, they're going to spend the next four decades in the wilderness. Now, as they're finally, you know, 38 years after that point, going back towards the promised land, they have to actually make their way around Edom. Edom comes from the the descendants of Esau, and they don't want Israel going through their land. So God says, well, I'm going to take you on a little detour around Edom. And because of that, the people are getting very impatient. They've been in the wilderness for years, camping. Any of you have been camping in a tent for a week? Anybody in here? A week? I'm not talking about glamping where there's like a TV... (laughs) and air conditioning. I'm in a tent. Any of you for two weeks? A month? Are you homeless? Or no? (laughs) Just imagine camping for years, years and years in the wilderness. Now, the people start to get discouraged. I've been processing this personally this week, that as we are on our way to the promised land, that this road that we're on is not going to be easy. It's going to be a rough road. Or as as Jesus described it later in the Sermon on the Mount, he said the gate is wide and the, the way is easy that leads to destruction, and many are those who find it. But the gate is narrow and the way is, listen to this, hard. The way is hard that leads to life, and few are those who find it. So we're on our way to the promised land, but it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a rough road. So we're to be patient during this this time. That's one of the fruits of the Spirit, just this long-suffering is what patience means. But we don't like to be patient. You know, uh, Margaret Thatcher once said, I'm extraordinarily patient, provided I get my own way in the end. And (laughs) I think a lot of us feel like that. You know, when, you, and when you're impatient, you start to grumble. Either internally or externally, this grumbling starts to happen. But God calls us to be patient. <coughs> Excuse me. To be patient with the people around us. To be patient with the circumstances that we're going through. The trials of life. As Tim Keller once said, trusting God eventually leads to, to rest and calm and, and peace and the ability to forgive. But if you give in to the self-trust, okay, you become, instead of trusting God, the self-trust, if if that happens, all of a sudden you start to get eaten up by all this resentment and self-pity and cynicism and anxiety and restlessness and, and ulcers and heart attacks and everything else. And there are times in your life where you're just going to have to make a decision. Am I going to trust God and his plan, or am I going to trust myself and my own plan? So with the difficult times, you may have to say like, 
Uh, Elizabeth Elliot once wrote, she said, God is God, and because he's God, he's worthy of my trust and, and, and obedience. So I will find rest nowhere but in his holy will that is unspeakable beyond my largest notions of even what he's up to. Because so often in life, we don't know. We, we don't know the, the overall picture of what God is doing. But can you trust God in the midst of this road to the promised land? And the Israelites didn't want to do that. And so they start to grumble. And that's the next sin that we see here. Look at verse 5. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there's no food, there's no water. We loathe this worthless food. So they're, they, they keep talking about Egypt. They're obsessed with the past. And that's one of the things we do when we're, we grumble. It's like, why have you brought us up out of Egypt? They, they couldn't celebrate what God was doing right now. Right at the beginning of this chapter, they had this great victory, and they didn't want to celebrate what God was doing right now. They were obsessed with what happened in the past. They kept thinking of the good old days in Egypt, and they glorified that time. Henry David Thoreau once said, never look back unless you're planning to go that way. It's often been said, you can't, you can't drive a car just looking in your rearview mirror. And that's, you have to think, what's the purpose of it? I mean, obviously, you've got to glance at the rearview mirror once in a while. And you do that to know when you could pass another car that's coming alongside you. And then once you pass that car once in a while, you can glance in the rearview mirror to see that they're not going to run into the back of you or come up on you again. But the rearview mirror is just to see, oh, I've gotten past that. Right? That's in the past now. That's what it's for. I'm beyond that now, right? To, and then to see if it's going to come up on you again. You, once in a while you look at it. But what, what we're, we're moving forward is looking through this huge windshield. You remember the size of the rearview mirror is really small compared to the size of your windshield because that's where you, you're moving forward. You're going ahead. The rearview mirror is small for a reason. You, you glance at it once in a while. It, you know, something you've gotten past. Something that God w walked you through. But you're still moving forward. Israel just keeps looking back. It's almost like they're like Lot's wife. Just keep looking back. And when you do that, you start to run into stagnation. And you might miss out on the blessings that God has for you right now. So they start grumbling, they start being obsessed with the past, they start fearing the future. It says this in verse 5, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? So now they think about dying in the wilderness. They're fearful of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, we're going to starve out here. We're going to thirst out here. We're, well, they're not trusting for God to provide for them in the future, so we know we're going to die. This inevitability of death. But it's not just the past. It's not just the future. They're hating the present. Verse 5, for there's no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. We don't like the food. We're hangry. <laughs> what was the food? Manna. Manna. I, I don't know what it was I, I, I have an idea that it was like a Krispy Kreme donut. That's what I think it was. <laughs> but they're even grumbling about that. Now I get there's only so many ways that you can make manna, right? There, you're having, in the morning, you get up and you're having some manna hotcakes. And then for lunch, it's, oh, okay, manna burgers. And we, we, okay, we'll do some manna burgers. And then dinner, we're going to do the, the uh, don't you make that uh, flaming manna souffle? It's pretty good, right? And uh, we've got the, um, the, the banana bread, I think is always a, is a good one. Manicotti, I, th I think, I don't. <laughs> but after a while, it's just, I don't, I don't like the food. So it, and now it's just, it's, it's, it's not just the past. It's not just the future. It's, it's right now. 
And what happens in that grumbling state, you start to take God out of the picture, and that's what they do. They become idolaters. Uh, the New Testament writes about this in 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to flip there. 1 Corinthians 10, because Paul describes what's happening in Numbers 21. And he says this. Let's just start in verse, um, verse 7. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, for it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So we saw that they were making this, this golden calf, right, in Exodus 32, and now they're becoming impatient with Moses and, and to come back down the mountain, so they start doubting, and, and so they say, we're just going to make our own plan. I don't know where God is right now. I don't know what God's doing, so I'm just going to do what I want to do. And when you start to go down that road of idolatry, it, it can lead to sexual immorality. Look at verse 8. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. So idolatry and sexual morality begin to happen at the same time. Or as 1 Corinthians 6 puts it, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters. You see it again when you get to the very end of the book with the church of Pergamum in Revelation 2.14. They talk about idolatry and sexual immorality. Why, are, why, is that correlate, why does that correlation exist? Because if when a society removes God out of the equation of life, what they start to do is they start to invent their own rules of morality. So when we aren't satisfied with God at the center of our existence, that disillusionment overflows into this area of sexuality. Or as Romans 1 puts it, when you reject God, he hands you over to dishonorable passions. So you see that happening in, in our society. You know, there's a, a book called Surfing for God by um, Michael Cusick, and he says this. G.K. Chesterton wrote that the man who knocks on the brothel door is knocking for God. If he were writing today, he might say that the man who surfs the web for porn is searching for God. See, there's a correlation there. And then you start testing God along the way. Look at the verse 9. Verse 9. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. So we don't think God's going to take care of us. We start to have all this doubt and fear that paralyzes us, overtakes us, to the point where we question whether God is even reliable or not. That's what's happening with the Israelites. They're questioning God's leading in their lives, and it leads to all this complaining. Verse 10 of 1 Corinthians 10, Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So now there's complaining, there's grumbling about everything. And instead of, you know, just, just being content with what God has given us right now and focusing on the joy of what the Lord has provided, either, either in the, the circumstances that we're in or the people that God's put into our lives. You know, like Corrie ten Boom once said in, in The Hiding Place, she said, this is what the past is for, right? Every experience God gives us, every person he puts in our lives is the perfect preparation for the future that only he can see. So do you trust him in that? That's what it comes down to. Israel complained about everything. You know, they complained about the bitter water in Exodus 15. They complained about not having enough food. In, in Exodus 16. They complain about being thirsty in Exodus 17. They complain about the manna that God gave them in Numbers 11. They complain about the leadership in Numbers 12. 
They complain about the report that they heard from the spies in Numbers 14. They complain about Aaron and Moses in, in, in Numbers 16. They complain after Korah's rebellion. And they complain again about the water in Numbers 20. They complain about lacking a variety of food. They, they complained about being in the desert. They complained about how long everything was taking. It's, start, it's starting to sound like my car ride with my kids on the way home. 40 years. I don't like the weather. I don't like the food. I don't like walking. God, what are you doing? And God's saying, I'm trying to teach you not to complain. <laughs> but eventually, God says, enough. Enough. There's going to be consequences for this sin. Turn back to Numbers 21 to see what those consequences are. Numbers 21, verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Now, why did God send snakes? I, I'm guessing, I, I think it's because God wanted to show them how destructive sin actually is. A lot of commentaries I was reading this week um, say that the actual snake, what kind of snake? It was probably a carpet viper. Uh, they're found in the Middle East. Um, in fact, the National Institutes of Health says that, that that particular snake bites and kills more people every year than any other snake. Uh, but they're found in the Middle East. They're very venomous. They're very aggressive. In fact, one bite from this snake has 70 milligrams of venom. 70, you only need five milligrams um, to die, okay? A, a human, a person only needs five milligrams to be fatally wounded. So just one bite could kill multiple people. They make this sound as they're going, as the, the rubbing sections of their body rub together. It sounds like sizzling. That could be the reference to fiery. It could be the pain that they experience when they get bit. It's just this fiery pain Either way, God is showing them that sin is going to destroy you. Not just physically. I'm talking spiritually. You know, many people have said that sin will take you farther than, than you ever intended to go. It will cost you more than you ever expected to pay. It will keep you longer than you ever intended to stay. It, it, will, it will destroy your mind, your conscience. It will harden your heart. It will destroy your body. As Romans 5 puts it, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. And so God starts to point to this, this serpent, that old serpent that you read about in Genesis 3. That old serpent that came to Eve and said, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Did God actually say that? Surely if you eat that fruit, that you will not die. So that serpent became a, a picture of sin, a picture of, of evil and deception. But God doesn't just leave us there. He, he shows us the cure for sin, but you've, you've got to recognize the urgency of it as you're going through life. When they were bitten, they had a few hours before they died. A few hours. You don't have time to just sit around for your, you know, whatever the life that God gives you on this earth and say, maybe I should accept the Lord someday, maybe not. There's an urgency about it. None of us know how much time we have here on this earth. So you, you recognize that, that it, it wasn't a matter of if I turn to God, then I won't get bitten by the snake. No, we're already all bitten by the snake of sin and the curse of death. So what, what's the pathway to salvation? You've got to repent. 
Look at verse 7, Numbers 21, verse 7. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. That's where you start. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So the people start to cry out and repent. We've sinned. You turn to God. You fall upon the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. And so repent means like this, this change of mind. It's a, it's a change of, of direction that God gives you. Not, not only the words here, he gives you a picture. A picture of listening to the Lord. Look at verse 8. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who's bitten when he sees it shall live. Okay, so there's nothing magical about the serpent on the pole. It's just listening to the Lord. What does God say to do? If you listen to the Lord and listen to what he says, just look and live, believe in God, believe that he can heal that that's what they had to do. And it, was, it all came down to belief, this look of belief. And they would be healed. It, and it wasn't very complicated. Just look and believe. It's not like you, you got to go to seminary first. You, you got to understand, you know, the difference between the, the hypostatic union and the hermeneutic of, of eschatology. No, just look to Jesus and live. Look to Jesus and live. And for some people, this is a real stumbling block. That's too simple. It has to be something about, I have to have this, you know, this great intellect, this superior upbringing or background. No, God just says, look to him and live. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're, you're weak or strong. The difference is, do you believe in the Lord that he can actually heal you, that he can take you from death to life? Look to him. Isaiah 45, 22 is what led Spurgeon to the Lord, which just says, turn to me and be saved. I think the King James says, look to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So it's a simple truth. Stop looking to yourself and everybody else for salvation and look to him. Amen? Amen. Look to Jesus, Hebrews 12 puts it. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. This is the gospel message. So when you fast forward to the New Testament, there's a guy named Nicodemus. He's a, a leader of the Jews. He's a Pharisee. And he comes to Jesus at night. And he says, you have to be from heaven. You have to be sent from God because nobody can do the things that you're doing unless they're sent from God. And so Jesus starts to tell him how to be born again. And what scripture does he use to do that? He turns to Numbers 21. Go to, go to John 3 and you'll see it. John 3, let's start in verse 12. John 3, verse 12. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Look at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So God gave his son to this perishing world that, that has been bitten by the, the serpents of sin and the these, these serpent laying horizontally on this vertical pole is a visual symbol of the cross. This is 2 Corinthians 5.21, that for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the gospel. That's why everyone, you know, everyone looks at John 3.16 and says, 
Oh, that's the greatest verse in the Bible. Why? Because it, it says, you know, for God is the, the greatest father, so loved, that's the greatest love, the world, that's the greatest need that he gave, that's the greatest gift, his one and only son, that's the greatest sacrifice, that whoever, whosoever, it's the greatest invitation, believes in him, it's the greatest commitment, shall not perish, it's the greatest salvation, but have eternal life. That's the greatest promise you will ever hear. This, this is how it all fits together. We have a perishing problem. For all who do not trust in Christ, there is a perishing problem. And perishing means you're, you're under the wrath of God. John 3.18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. And it, it's not just dying. It's being judged by God. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So that means that there's a, 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 a you're not just going out of existence when you die. There's a, it, it's being separated from God. Like it says in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his might. So there's a separation there. There's a punishment. There's suffering as it describes it in Revelation 14, 10. He will also drink of the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. This is an eternal consequence. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, Matthew 25, verse 46. Now, I tell you this today. You know, I share this with you so that not just so that you can see the bad news, but that you can see the good news, that you can see the love of God, that you can turn from your sin and run towards the love of God. Because every one of us is going to stand before God one day. And you're, you're not going to be able to say to him, after hearing this message today, nobody ever told me what was at stake. You're hearing it right now. So run to the love of God. Look to him and live. Now you see how all the verses start to fit together. You know, I was, I was listening to a, a, a talk by Jordan Peterson. He was talking about this, this idea that the Bible is the first hyperlink text. I don't know if you've seen, can we put that picture up there? That just shows all of these references. And, you know, a, a hyperlink is just like these, it shows these internal um, interconnections, Right? So if you look at a site like Wikipedia, you'll see lots of links to different sites. They're interlinked to each other to form this web of knowledge. Well, the Bible is interlinked in a similar way, except you're not just clicking on a link. You're going to turn the pages. And when you see John 3.16 or John 3.14 and 15, you're going to be able to, it links to Numbers 21. But every one of those you know, it's, it's 63,779 cross-references in the Bible linked together. 40 different authors over a period of 1,600 years written in three different languages that tells the same story. Here's the curse of sin. Here's the consequences for sin. And here's the cure. Look to the Lord and live. Look to the Lord and live. And your salvation can happen immediately. Numbers 21.9. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Immediately, you move from death to life. One moment, 
You've got the curse of the serpent's bite and that venom flowing through your veins. And the next minute, through faith, your life is transformed and you receive eternal life. This is the good news. And it's not because of anything we did. It's all because of grace. In fact, let me show you this. In Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy verse 8. I know I'm running out of time. Here we go. Deuteronomy verse 8. Verse 14. You forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock. So he's saying, I'm going to give you two warnings here. One, don't forget what God has done for you. And two, don't think you're saved by your own strength and your own effort and your own power. Look at verse 16. Who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do, to do you good in the end. Verse 17. Here it is. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. It's by grace. That's how you're healed. Not because of your spiritual superiority. <laughs> no, they were impatient. They were grumbling. They were obsessed with the past. They're fearful about the future. They hated the present. They're idolaters. They're sexually immoral. They're testing God. They're complaining. They're filled with anger. They're filled with all kinds of rebellion. And so are all of us. And even then, God says, I'm going to give you a way out. A gift of salvation. And along the way, I want you to also beware of the poor substitutes for Jesus. If you want to know the rest of the story... And I'll just close with this, you know, as Paul Harvey used to say, the rest of the story, the bronze serpent later became a distraction for Israel. They started to make it into an idol. And King Hezekiah is the one who actually tore it down. And it says in 2 Kings 18.4 that he removed the, the high places and broke the pillars and cut down uh, the Asherah. And listen to this. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people of Israel had made offerings to it. They started to turn God's blessing into an idol. Listen. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and everything else is just a poor substitute. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. <laughs> and we're going we're gonna to close the service with communion this morning. And even communion, uh, many churches over the centuries have turned into an idol. Start to say, when you take the cup and you take the bread, that the, the cup actually turns into the, the actual blood of Jesus. And the, the bread is the actual body of Christ. It's called transubstantiation. In other words, you're, you're, you start to turn even the bread and the cup into an idol. Beware of, of, of that. And it's just... It's, it's a picture, it's a, it's a symbol of what Christ has done. The, the bronze serpent was a picture of what Christ does in salvation. It's Jesus sitting down and, and teaching his followers, saying, I, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. 
And if anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. It's Jesus saying, this manna that we've been reading about, it's a, it's a picture. It's a picture of what Christ has done for you. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, we see the, the urgency here. That without you, we're, we're perishing because of our sin. And those sins are many. We've leaned on our own way, our own plan. We've been impatient and grumbling and obsessed with the past and fearful of the future hating the things of the present and not seeing the, the victories of what you're doing now. and It's led us to be idolaters, sexually immoral, testing God, rebellious, stubborn. saved. It's not going to be because of my own strength. I've tried that. Everything I've tried is just a poor substitute for you, Lord. So I just, I lay my life down before you right now, and I say, will you save me? I'm, I'm just looking to you, Lord. I'm fixing my eyes on you. I'm turning from the world and my old sinful ways and I'm looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. Save me. Change me. Transform me. And Lord, as I walk out of here today, I know I'm never going to be the same. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.